so good afternoon students so let's talk about there are different topics we will be discussing today and we will start with different types of flasks so you can see this is a conical flask some graduation is there graduation marks are there so that you can roughly see what is the content of the liquid in this particular flask so they may be of different sizes so this is the bigger one not the biggest one and then another one is there which is a smaller one okay so even bigger than this flask conical flask can be there because this is conical in shape so this is called conical flask and there are different types of flasks so this is conical flask flat bottom flask has also there also there so a spherical bottom will be there but bottom will be flat so that it can stay and then there are volumetric flasks also so which can be used to measure or make up the volume so those flasks are also being used in the laboratory Uh, volumetric flask you can bring yes. so volumetric flask can be used to make up the volume and for making of volume measuring cylinders can also be used but what is the difference between or why we should go for measuring cylinder and why we should go for volumetric flask so if you make up the volume in measuring cylinder then you have to transfer transfer the solution to some other container because it it cannot be stay cannot be kept in measuring cylinder you have to transfer in case if you are making some reaction something like that and then finally you want to make up the volume and so in that case you should use uh, volumetric flask do all the reactions and once reaction is there or addition of everything is there now finally you have to make up the volume so you can use that volumetric flask and make up the volume so volumetric flask is something like this okay and the bottom is flat so you can easily keep it here why this is called volumetric flask okay this is actually not the volumetric flask because in case of volumetric what is the difference between this is simple flask this is not volumetric flask let me see if it is available so in case of volumetric flask if you want to know what is difference between this flask and what is difference between how it is different from vol a volumetric flask so this is a normal flask in volumetric flask there will be one marking here it is not here but, but bring the one where marking is clear it is very Uh, even it is difficult to see seen by me then you have to find out something of course the flask uh, mark is there but it will be very very difficult for you to see the mark somewhere here mark is there so let us see if yeah uh, yeah this where my finger is there so there is one mark the very difficult very thin marking is there so very difficult to see the mark so you have to put the liquid so that it will just coming to this place so at the mark and then then what will be the volume so that you can see here if you can see something written here 
again that is very faint one 250 ml if you can see by the way 250 ml so this volumetric flask is for 250 ml let us see the next one this is also like that just mark it so after putting the different reagents you can mix it and then after mixing you have to put drop or drop so that the finally volume comes to this place when that level comes to this place means the net volume in this is 250 ml and you can see the marking can be here also so now you can see that this marking it should be clear like this so that you can make up the volume up to this point okay so here this is conical flask here also marking is there so why not to use this marking to make up the volume why why we cannot use this for making up the volume why we you uh, use this or why we call this one as volumetric flask why we cannot call it volumetric conical flask this is not volumetric conical flask of course mark marking is there but this is not used to make up the volume what may be the reason can you guess if you look at the shape of these two flasks so this is conical in nature hmm? and suppose you want to make up the volume maybe 200 maybe 300 or 400 then one thing i am going to tell you about meniscus later on so just see it will be very very difficult or precision very will be very very less if you use this to make up the volume but we have to compare comparatively precision will be more if you use this volumetric flask because the level where you have to check or see is the narrow tube like structure so here precision will be more compared to this conical flask where you have to see the so big area here now to make up the volume and this is very thin neck so because of thin neck you can make up the volume very easily like in case of pipette pipettes are again thinner so this is again made thinner so that accuracy will go on increasing if it is still thicker then accuracy will be less and similarly if you want more accuracy but lesser volume so this is 250 ml volumetric flask so similarly you will find 25 ml volumetric flask of course the smaller is in size and there this neck or this tube will be thinner so thinner the tube more accuracy so this was all about uh, volumetric flask so one thing is that if you want to make up the volume then just a minute bring some water 100 ml 250 ml so making up the volume that also is technical thing so we will try to use this flask and of course in case while you are using pipette or you are using volumetric flask and then again i am going to tell you about burette use of burette so everywhere all these three places we have to be technical technically sound or we should have some knowledge how to make up the volume or how to see the level
at least 300 ml. So we will put water here. So it's going on like this. So now we have to put slowly. Okay. So you can see the marking and a meniscus made by water filled in this. So if you can see the meniscus and marking on this neck, you will find that the meniscus, the upper part of the meniscus and lower bottom of the meniscus, there are two different, there is gap at least one or two mm difference is there and marking of course very thin marking is there so which part upper part or lower part should be touching the marking that is the important part so the difference between the upper part and lower part of meniscus will be minimum if the thickness of this tube is very less thinner the tube the difference in meniscus will be very very less thicker the tube meniscus difference in meniscus will be more so we can consider that this is a little bit thicker tube that is why the difference in upper part and lower part of the meniscus is about 1 mm or 1.5 mm and maybe uh, 2 mm but if this is the case and we have to find out whether we to make it 250 ml exactly 250 ml should we need to put some more water or this is okay okay so it can be seen like this it can be seen like this and it can be seen like this so whenever you want to see the level of this marking and level should be in the level of my eyes so you have to bring to this place not like you don't have to see like this you don't have to see like this keeping it up or keeping it down it should be in the level of your eyes now you can see if if i see i find that the bottom of the meniscus is lower and this line this marking on the tube is touching upper part of the meniscus so we need to put little bit more water maybe one or two drops oh and now you can see this has gone more than that line. So we have to take it back. Now this is less and we have to put slowly. Maybe. Yes. It should go drop by drop. Again high. So this is the problem. That is why we are we have stopped using these things. We will go on trying sometimes more, sometimes less. Now it has again gone down. So we have to put only one or two drop, not more than that. But because this is a big beaker, so we have to go for a smaller container. Otherwise, more amount of water is going at a time and this is creating problem in maintaining the water. So now you can see I am using this flask containing little bit of water so water will be going here very very slowly very less amount of water will be going so i should be able to maintain volume now 
pass. Drop by drop, I am able to go. Okay. So instead of using this much big beaker full of water for making up the whole room, you have seen two, three times I was trying, either more water is going, and then when I am taking back, more water is coming out. So I have used a small container with a small amount of water because only a small amount of water I have to add it and then we have been successful. Now we can see that keeping this in the level of my eyes and then if I see the lower portion of the meniscus is at the marking. So this is the, now I can see you have to maintain volume like this. Earlier just I added two drops of water and then the meniscus, lower portion of meniscus is touching this marking. So this is the correct volume. And how I am trying to see this level, meniscus and marking by keeping in horizontal to my eye level. So you have to see or, or if this is matching, means this is the correct point of adjustment of the volume. So now the whatever volume is there inside this volumetric flask is 250 ml okay so this was about volumetric flask now we will try to see so similarly this beaker is there marking is there so you should this marking are just to have rough idea about it this is not to make up the volume remember it if you are trying to make up volume using this marking, so that will be very, very approximate value only, not accurate. Accuracy will be very, very less there. Okay. So we have seen flask and then we have seen that this is normal flask, of course, conical flask, round bottom flask, but Bottom is round, but this is volumetric flask because this is narrow one. So round bottom flask, normal, not volumetric, will have this thicker. This tube will be very, very thick. That is not volumetric. So whenever volumetric flask is there, this will be thin and there should be marking. Marking was very, very uh, not easily visible. So we try to make marking with black marker so that while adjusting the volume, the marking or the level where we have to maintain the meniscus should be clearly visible. So that also we try to make it with marker. So different type of flask, uh, I have given some idea about the flask. So now we, we will try to see the burettes. So this is the burette you can see. Of course, this is a very big one, so only part of this can be seen and let me keep it away so that you can see. So this one will this much big, okay. You can see that marking graduation is there and there is a stop cock here. So this can move, okay. So this is the burette, upper part of the burette, then marking you can see this and this is the lower part of buret very thin nozzle type thing and there is one stop one. okay and this one is the buret stand you can see buret stand so this is just for keeping it here let me try to show you so buret should be fixed in buret stand Let me show you how it is looking like. You can see this is the burret placed in burette stand like this. And then this is the arrangement how burette is fixed in that. So if you want to take out the burret from here, then you have to press it. press here and then you can take this out. I cannot do it alone. So this is something like that. Okay. 
सो वाई वी नीड टू यूज ब्यूरेट और इन विच एक्सपेरिमेंट वी नीड टू यूज ब्यूरेट सो वेन एवर वी आर डूइंग टाइट्रेशन एक्सपेरिमेंट वी यू नीड टू यूज दिस ब्यूरेट एंड अगेन वी हैव टू सी वट इज द वॉल्यूम लेट मी टेल यू फर्स्ट द यूज ऑफ ब्यूरेट I said titration. What do you mean by titration? So, titration means finding out the strength of a solution kept in a beaker. Maybe uh, the solution in this, and using the solution in taken in burette, and you are mixing in this drop by drop by opening this, it will drop in this, and then you have to mix it. and then you have to check that the ph becomes neutral it so neutralizes the solution maybe based in this burette acid in this and strength and volume see you must be knowing n1 v1 is equal to n2 v2 if three things are known then fourth can be calculated so that calculation say for example you are taking 100 ml one molar nsa uh, sorry hcl one normal hcl 100 ml and you want to titrate that or you want to find out that the 50 ml nawh solution i have taken what is the strength of that nawh solution that you want to know so out of four things three things are known known first the solution one which volume is 100 ml its strength is one normal so two things are known now coming to the base base is naoh and its volume is 50 ml that is known but what is the strength of this base that is not known so if you want to know what is the strength of base of 50 ml which has been given in this container if you want to know you have to do titration for doing titration you will take 50 ml of naoh in this beaker no, sorry in conical flask and the known strength of solution that is hcl one normal you will take in this burette and then slowly by drop by drop you will start putting in this and you will be mixing so that acid and base they are mixed together of course this will, this will not be in my hand this will be put into the burette test tank so something like that it will be okay let me keep it here so like that it will be so let me keep it like this and then drop by drop it will be allowed by moving this one uh, stop for by uh, opening this drop by drop it will be coming down and then try to mix it and then you have to see either you have to use some indicator or you have to use ph meter to see that what is the ph of it and you will go on adding drop by drop until this ph of the, this what was here nawh solution pH of this becomes seven, means neutral pH. You know that pH of NaOH solution will be more than seven, and pH of this solution taken in burette, that is HCl, will be less than seven. So if you go on adding, this neutralization solution will uh, neutralization reaction will be going on, and then when pH of this this content becomes seven, then you will stop adding. nawh hcl solution in this then in the beginning where from where you started adding so if if you started from 50 ml or 100 ml whatever you do so you will make up the or you note down the uh, reading from where you started and there while noting down the reading you have to be careful you are noting down correctly so you have to come to 
bring your eyes to the level of the content in the tube so initially the level must be initially when you feel that it's uh, hcl was here so after adding hcl came here down to this so to read here you have to stand up because you have to bring your eyes to this level okay if it is like this then you have to stand up and bring your eyes to this level and read it correctly so when you have added so now the volume has gone down so you have to come down your eyes should be here and then take the reading so you will find the reading how much hcl you have added in this to neutralize it okay so this is called titration and then you can easily using the formula n1 v1 is equal to n2 v2 you can calculate the strength of naoh given to you unknown solution strength of unknown solution given to you okay using the formula n1 v1 is equal to n2 v2 so out of the four things three things we are known four things to find out the strength or volume whatever is it is there you you are doing titration experiment using burex and the main thing i think i wanted you to know that how to take exactly correct reading the initial reading and the final reading so you have to bend down or you have to go down you have to stand up so that your eye level should be in the level of the uh, content in the burette because burette is a small tube earlier it will be level will be up and then after adding it will come down so accordingly you have to bring your eyes to this level or that level then only you have to take the reading you should not take reading like this by looking at up, uh, means you are looking from bottom and then seeing not like that you i should be in the level then only you will be get the correct uh, reading okay so we have so seen about uh, uh, burets we have seen what uh, different types of flask also we have seen now let us see the separating funnel you uh, i was showing in the last class i have shown you the funnel that is the normal funnel we use uh, for different purposes transferring the uh, solution from one container to another container we are using normal funnel but you can see many of you might have seen if not you can see here what is this this one this is called separating funnel okay so what is the normal funnel normal funnel cut cut to this place but some extra portion is here so that is why the purpose of this is separate something otherwise this look like funnel from here if you see this is something like funnel below my hands so this is like funnel and the extra things are there and here you find that this is stop cock knob is also there so regulate how much things to come down and you can see this is again opening is there so this particular this equipment is called separating funnel and this is used to separate something say for example you want to separate you uh, you are mixing oil and water together and after mixing doing something now you want to separate separate oil from water so in that case you can use separating funnel so the mixture of oil and water can be poured in this by opening this one you open it and pour your pour uh, everything all the oil and uh, uh, water mixture here you have to keep it close so that it should not come down so everything is collected here and again you can put in the stand so a stand will be something like that so it will be holding here so after some time you will find that oil and water which were mixed because of we try to do some experiment and it has been mixed so if you leave for some time they will be separated from each other so you will find that oil is set settling down in the bottom and water is 
floating over it or something reverse it will be reverse because oil is lighter so it will be at the top and water is heavier so it will be at the bottom so bottom portion will be water and oil will be making layer on the top okay so now both of them means these two components have been separated from each other but how to kick out water from oil so in that case if you open this one you take a beaker beaker and put like this okay so now open the this one open the knob so this oil filled up to this slowly it will be coming down and then water upper portion don't shake it slowly let it come down so all the water will be coming down and upper portion is uh, oil so that will also coming down so you have to regulate using this so you have to close you will see that water is coming here come. and from this portion onward oil is there so you open it so that water is coming down as soon as it, all the water has come now oil is coming to close it okay so only oil is here all the waters have come down and that is what you wanted you wanted to separate oil and water so water has been now come back come to this beaker and all the oil is here so you can pour using means this opening you can take out oil separately and water has come separately one or two drop mixing may be there but major part of oil and water has been separated so for that purpose this separating funnel is used maybe there are three four components and all the layers you are able to see that the upper layer then middle layer then uh, second lower level and the lowest level they are all four separate but how to separate them so you can use this separating funnel the first layer has gone down stop it okay then second layer has gone down stop it then third and then one by one you can collect the layer so that way you can separate so in that case this separating funnel is very very useful okay so this separating funnel the capacity is 1 liter so a smaller se separating funnel is also there so depending on the requirement what is the total volume of your mix mix mixture of solution so accordingly you can take bigger separating funnel or a smaller separating funnel and as per requirement you can go for easy tank okay now the next thing we are going to see is the condenser okay so you can see the structure this structure this is called condenser and where we use this or where you can you can see that this is being used generally we use this one in distillation unit okay so distillation unit some boiling water say for example water is boiling here and you are putting like this so water will boil here and you can see the balls globular structure is there this ball this ball this ball this ball so what if water is boiling here the steam will be formed or steam will be coming through this is this is connected one the in this uh, bulb it will come it will come to this place and the outer chamber in this outer chamber the bulb series of bulb is there that is inner chamber so in inner chamber that vapor is there in outer chamber you can allow cold water to get entry here and coming out there so continuously water is getting entry in the outer chamber cold water is there and water is coming down so in, in the inner chamber steam is there that is hot so this cold water is allowing that uh, steam to condense condense back to water okay and that water can be collected so that is what is this is why it is called condenser 
so whatever steam is there inside hot steam it will cool down by the circulating cold water and then the steam when it is getting condensed that will again come back to gaseous position to liquid position of water and that water will not contain any contaminants only water will be there so that is how we can make distilled water is boil the water steam will be coming up because it is lighter it will come up it will come in the tube and then in the surrounding cold water is there so that vapor will be condensed and that can be collected so in distillation we need this type of condensers are being used so that vapor or hot vapor is getting condensed into liquid form and that liquid water is called distilled water so again if you do this process then the water will become double distilled water so single distilled water means this boiling conversion into the steam and then condensation so one distillation so again that distilled water the first single distilled water is again boiled again it will be converted into a steam and again condensed to water so that will become that will be called double distilled water so in case little bit contamination is there of course it should not be theoretically it should not be there but for any region practically there is little bit contamination so that contamination maybe you can say that 99% contamination is removed by single distillation theoretically it should be 100% removal of contamination but practically suppose 99% or 99.9% contamination is removed but still 1% or 0.1% contamination is there that can be removed if you do double distillation so in case of double distillation the water purity may go up to 99.99% so 0.01% contamination that is practical theoretically in the first round of uh, distillation it should be 100% pure but practical and theory there is little bit difference so in, in, in uh, the first distillation unit maybe 99.99% pure water and the second distillation 99.999% so something like that so more pure water if you, if you want to get you need to do double distillation so in case of double distillation one dist one condenser will be there and then whatever output first distilled water is there that will go to the second condenser again it will be condensed so double distillation okay so in case of double distillation you will find two condensers but this is not the distillation unit condenser just an example of condenser how it looks like in case of uh, distillation unit this is not bulb type condenser there is coiling of the inner chamber inner chamber is coiled and that coil of tube is kept inside a outer chamber okay so i need to take camera to lab so that uh, that is why i cannot show you just i wanted to show you using this uh, one of the example of condenser okay so that's all about condenser and what is the use where it is used that also i have uh, mentioned now i would like to tell you about these are the thermometers and you know that thermometers are used to see the temperature so generally you find that there is one small bulb here and thermometer contains they are made of mercury so this bulb is looking bright no silver made of silver something like that but this is not made of silver this bulb contains mercury so that mercury you are able to see some looking like silver silver metal or something uh, iron metal is there so and the property of mercury is that with a little bit heat it, if you provide little bit heat 
it will expand so if i touch if i keep it my it is taking heat from my body and it will start expanding so when it is expands there is very thin tube in this very thin tube and there is marking on it you can see marking is here something written here if you can see and then back of this white strip has been made okay so because of this white strip you will be able to read what is written to make the re reading easier this white strip is there in the back hmm? and then this mercury when it takes heat from maybe because i am holding it it is taking heat from my body and then expanding so this this metallic thing you know this rising in the tube so it may not be visible to you it will go on rising go on climbing you can say and then how much it has it has climbed so it has been calibrated accordingly so depending on the temperature of my body it will rise so what will be the my uh, temperature of my body 30 around 37 degree centigrade so it will go to 37 degree marking and then i can know that yes my body temperature is 37 degree if i take boiling water in this okay just this is not boiling water but assume that this is, this was just boiling i have brought hmm. and if i put this thermometer inside that then this will start taking temperature uh, heat from this uh, water hot water and it will start expanding and what is the purpose i want to know what is the temperature of this uh, the water which i was just boiling it so maybe say for example 95 degree 95 degree centigrade temperature is there so if i put like this and then by taking heat that mercury will start climbing it will come to this point okay and then you can read what is the temperature of this water by reading here so how much energy or how much heat it is getting from this water accordingly the mercury will expand and it will go on climbing it will go on climbing till it is getting heat from this and then you can know what is the temperature of this particular solution so so that is the use of thermometer you can see the temperature of the liquid maybe water maybe some other solution maybe anything so for that purpose we are using thermometer and then so this you might have seen and you can see that this is the cover because this is made of glass no and this will be broken made of glass if you drop it or something getting dropped on it it will be broken so that is why there is one plastic cover so like that you can put inside this and it will be little bit safer than keeping open okay so here you you saw that there are other different types of thermometer for made uh, with the convenience hmm. here you can see in that thermometer you saw that uh, that the back strip was white, uh, white in color here you can see this is yellow in color okay so in this case visual visibility will be little bit better here also mercury and then the para mercury that line getting up it is little bit difficult to read it you have to move this way that way and then with little bit little bit difficulty of course you can read what is the temperature and see some attachment it has been kept here so that you can you can uh, just put some uh, thread and bind and drop somewhere maybe water bath or anywhere so th those different type of devices are being made for the convenience so this is again okay so there are certain thermometers of course i am not able to find it here 
so instead of the white bar getting up and where is the bar that is become that is sometimes becomes very difficult somebody can see somebody cannot see and uh, if you see right now the temperature is here this bar is here but you will not be able to see in the camera to make it clear sometime this bar na no, color of this bar is made red so that can be easily tracked if red bar is going up and down you can easily so you can see that that type of thermometer is also here to make reading accurate and for better precision maybe bar is not here but by mistake you are seeing oh, yes, something is there means you are taking wrong reading but if it is red clearly white background or yellow background or any other background except red it can be easily seen that yes bar is up to this level so what is beside this what is the reading so that is the temperature you can clearly see so different types of thermometer is there and depending on the requirement how much convenient it is there for you to read it if you are not finding that yes this is difficult i am not able to read it or some problem is there then you can select for this type of thermometer or that type of thermometer again cm thermometer can be used for all the purposes say for example i was showing you this thermometer and this thermometer can take temperature up to 50 degree centigrade but can i use this thermometer to measure my body temperature you must be knowing that body temperature is 97 degree if i say 97 degree is it okay it is not okay 97 degree what 97 degree centigrade no our body temperature is not 97 degree centigrade our body temperature is 97 degree or we can say 98 degree roughly 98 degree centigrade no it is not 98 degree centigrade it is 98 degree fahrenheit so you have to be very very careful about the unit this thermometer is made for centigrade so 50 degree this can measure temperature up to 50 degree centigrade so if we want to see what is the temperature of this hot water which was just boiling now i have stopped boiling now after 1 minute what is the temperature can you measure the temperature using this thermometer no because you are expecting that the water which was boiling just 1 minute ago it will have temperature something around 80 degree maybe 75 degree or maybe 85 degree but this thermometer measures up to 50 degree centigrade only so you have to be very very careful in selecting so for that you have to select the thermometer where the range is up to 100 degree centigrade so this thermometer cannot be used but you have to go for the thermometer which is having reading up to 100 degree centigrade so similarly this thermometer cannot be used to take our body temperature because our body temperature is taken in fahrenheit if you want to use this thermometer to measure body temp your body temperature then you then you should know that what will be your body temperature in centigrade because this will tell you all the reading in centigrade not in fahrenheit and if you don't know that of course maybe you can make calculations but if you are able to make calculation then you must be also be knowing that in centigrade scale your body temperature will be something around 37 degree centigrade so 37 degree centigrade can be measured using this thermometer because this is of 50 degree so somewhere here you will find that 37 degree marking will be there and if you hold it for some time you will find that that para that bar is coming up to this place and my body temperature is 36 37 39 or something like that that can be so you have to very very careful when you are trying to use a thermometer what is the expected temperature you are, you are you are trying to 
measure and the thermometer is suitable for that purpose or not. Say for example, you want to measure the temperature in the freezer compartment of your refrigerator. So what is the expected temperature of the freezer compartment of your refrigerator? Obviously, your answer will be what? Maybe 0 degree, maybe minus 2 degree, maybe minus 5 degree. So this thermometer cannot be used to measure temperature. So this thermometer is 10 degree to 50 degree centigrade. So maximum plus 10 degree to plus 50 degree. This cannot measure temperature in minus or even less than 10 degree. Say for example, uh, the lower compartment of a refrigerator, you want to know what is the temperature in the lower compartment. So temperature in the lower compartment of your fridge, refrigerator is supposed to be around 5 degree centigrade. But this, temp this thermometer minimum reading is 10 degree centigrade. So this thermometer cannot be used to take temperature of your refrigerator. So refrigerator temperature is supposed to be around 4 degree. Little bit less or little bit more may be there. But freezing compartment, it will be 0 degree or less than 0 degree. Minus 2, minus 3, minus 5, maybe minus 10 degree. So if you want to take temperature of refrigerator, lower compartment, you have to go for the uh, thermometer which starts from 0 to maybe 25, 30, 40, 50 degree centigrade. Then only the lower compartment temperature, something like 4 degree, 5 degree, 6 degree, 7 degree, that can be read. But this thermometer cannot be used because minimum reading is 10 degree centigrade. So similarly, if you want to uh, take temperature of your freezer compartment, then you have to go for the thermometer which is able to take temperature in minus. So the thermometer which is used, uh, which is having marking of minus 10, minus 20, maybe minus 22, plus 20 range thermometer. If you are using that one, then you will be able to measure the temperature. So this was in brief about use of different type of thermometer and then you have to be very careful what will be the expected temperature and what is the range of that particular thermometer. So accordingly you have to use or you have to uh, select the thermometer to be used. Okay. So that was all about thermometers. So now we will go to see vacuum pump. Okay. So vacuum pump is made to create vacuum. Okay. So I will try to show you the vacuum pump. One of the example, just an example of vacuum pump. So this you can see that this is your vacuum pump operated by electricity. Okay. And then you can see that there is gauge. This is handle by for lifting it. Okay. And how much vacuum created. So those things can be seen here. Okay. And this is the lead to connect to electricity. Okay. And this is the tube tubing, which tube is used to connect. Okay. So this will create vacuum, but where to create vacuum? So this is a container. You can connect to this. Just a minute. So like this, if you switch it on, this is, this tube is connected to this one and this will create vacuum inside this chamber. Okay. 
so you can open this chamber you can keep your material here in this chamber you can close it mm -hmm. and then if you switch it on this vacuum pump this will create vacuum in this through this all the air inside that that will be sucked by this vacuum pump and then vacuum will be created in that chamber okay so there are certain use of the vacuum pump and sometimes we need to create a vacuum so whenever particularly vacuum is generated for penetration of something if you want that something should go penetrating inside then you need to keep in the vacuum so that all the air will come out wherever airs are present they will be coming out and when they are coming out it, if it is dipped in some liquid that liquid will that solution will go inside so if you want to make the penetration better it should go inside the liquid should go inside in the minor pores where the liquid will not get entry because air is already filled so if you take out the air that space will be free or empty where that liquid will go inside so for that reason we need to create vacuum so for creating vacuum you have to create uh, you have to use vacuum pump and desiccate it like this so you will keep your sample there and in that chamber vacuum will be created so whatever air is there it will be sucked and then if your material is dipped inside some liquid so if air is coming out so the liquid will go inside the space so of course this is a smaller uh, vacuum pump depending depending on the requirements this vacuum pump may be more powerful or it can create more vacuum so intensity of vacuum also matters if you want each and every small amount of air in the smallest pocket or smallest hole this should all come out then you have to use powerful vacuum pump and you have to keep in vacuum for a longer period if you want that yes a little bit whatever wherever water is there so major water portion should be taken out then vacuum pump like this a smaller vacuum pump can also be used and you don't need to apply very long uh, powerful vacuum pump for longer period even a smaller period minor uh, air pockets are there they will be coming out but very very minute air pockets if you want to take out each and every bit of air then you have to use powerful vacuum pump and you have to keep in um, vacuum condition for a longer period so that each and every part of the air slowly it will be coming out and that will be filled by the solution so that reaction or penetrance can improve now we will talk about different baths so i am going to talk about three different types of bath so one can be water bath which we generally nowadays in the laboratories we are using very commonly not in all the labs but almost all the labs water baths are being used and you must be knowing that boiling point of water is 100 degree so the temperature maximum temperature of water bath can be 100 degree centigrade if you want kuch kaam hai kya lab mein baat karenge kuch bhi dar to dikhe nahi ye kaam ho gaya hai to dal le kaam hai so if you want more temperature 
say for example beyond 100 degree temperature then you cannot use water bath because as long as water is there in the water bath the temperature will not go beyond 100 degree. okay so if you want say for example 150 degree 200 degree 250 degree something like that then you have to use some other bath means instead of water something else should be filled so that next thing is oil bath you must be knowing that temperature of boiling temperature of oil may be industrial oil or we can say cooking oil or maybe mustard oil maybe soybean oil or this oil that one any other oil that temperature will be more than 100 boiling temperature of oil is more than 100 degree. so again depending on the requirement of <coughs> temperature what temperature you want you can change the oil in the oil bath okay so you can get more temperature so either it is oil bath or it is water bath liquid is filled in that of course in oil bath different types of oil can be there for depending on the uh, what is the maximum temperature you require and accordingly what is the boiling temperature of this oil or that one so you are going to change the oil depending on your requirement and seeing at what is the boiling temperature of that oil so if you require 150 degree temperature in oil bath then you we are going to fill that oil in the oil bath which is having boiling temperature of around means more than 150 degree and then you will have uh, thermal uh, thermal controller so that when the temperature is going to 150 degree it will stop heating if it is going down again heating so thermostat should be there on all the oil bath so that it is maintaining temperature up to 100 degree water bath is perfectly working if you need 65 degree temperature you put on the uh, thermostat on that it will maintain 65 degree centigrade it's not going to boil if you want 95 degree temperature it will maintain 95 degree temperature if you want 100 degree temperature then it will maintain 100 degree temperature and then only you can see that in water bath water is boiling so when 100 degree temperature is only you can see the water boiling if 90 degree temperature is the requirement water will not boil because water is not boiling at 90 degree water will boil only at 100 degree. but the maximum range should be there and below that range you can maintain any temperature depending on or using the thermostat similarly in case of oil bath again you are going to select the oil which oil to be used there and then thermostat will try to maintain the temperature so both of these oil or water they are liquid in nature so if you put something uh, some tube in water bath it will go inside it will dip inside that so if you are using oil bath then oil bath or water bath then there will be problem So you need to use float so that your material is not going on dipping inside the float. Okay, so the float should be there so that you can use the float and your tube or whatever material is there, they are floating on the surface. So last time I was trying to show you one float. So that float can be used to keep your material floating on the surface of oil bath or water bath it should not the tube or uh, whatever material is there this should not dip inside the oil bath or water bath this should be not completely dipping inside but part of the tube should be dipped inside the water bath or oil bath so that it will be heated up from all the sides so that oil or water will be continuous in touch of the 
tube surface of the tube from outside and the tube will be heated up so that the content inside the tube will be heated up now again it depends what should be the thickness of that tube say for example last time we have seen that in case of pcr again heating and cooling is there so thin wall tube is used so that quickly it should be heated up and quickly it should be cooled down in case of pcr but in case of what pcr for seconds or maybe 1 minute or 2 minute cooling and then maybe a few seconds heating again few, uh, after few seconds cooling so very frequent heating and cooling is going on that is why thin wall tube is used so that cooling and heating should be done quickly but generally in case of water bath and oil uh, bath you are keeping for 5 minutes 10 minutes 20 minutes so there is no need of using very thin wall tube and also again you have to see the material made of the tube made of which material depend should depend on the temperature say for example you want to uh, heat something at 250 degree centigrade and your tube is made of plastic and that plastic of more maybe around 200 200 degree centigrade the plastic will melt so your content will also go off so you 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 may need to use metallic tubes so depending on the targeted temperature you have to see what is the uh, tube made of which material it is made of and which bath to be used so all these th things have to be considered and then float also float is made of plastic or if the plastic is not standing that much temperature it will melt so it should be made of metal or if you are putting something the uh, tube or the um, float that is made of the material which is reacting with the content oil maybe water or something like that then they that should be neutral this this should not react with each other or whatever the uh, material of the tube that react with the content inside the tube or the other reagent inside the tube they should also not react that is why plastic tubes are used because plastic is almost uh, maybe uh, silicon coated plastic should be there so that it is not going to stick to the surface of the uh, plastic tube so depending on the requirement you have to find out some problem will be there so you have to find out the solution if this is not working well something else should be tried so two types of bath we have discussed water bath and oil bath the third bath we are going to discuss is the sand bath which is rarely used in the lab generally we are using water bath less frequently we are using oil bath and of course somewhere for some purpose somebody must be using oil bath and you may need some time to use sand bath so when we require sand bath or why we require sand bath so just we have seen that up to 100 degree temperature we can easily use water bath if we need more than 100 degree temperature maybe 100 to 200 250 degree temperature oil bath can be used but if we need 400 500 degree centigrade temperature then what to use then neither we can use water bath nor we can use oil bath we will have to go for sand bath so because the sand temperature may go up to around 500 degree centigrade and if your requirement is 400 degree centigrade then you can easily use sand bath so in case of sand bath again sand is heated and you know sand is loosely packed material no you can make some space you can make a uh, big uh, hole Mm. and if you want to heat this one so you can put this and sand will be covering like this 
So all these portion will be, suppose my hand is nothing but sand. So all these portion will be heated up. So this is what we need. If we use some uh, platform, then it will be like that. So only bottom things will be used. So if it is sand, then you can create, make a uh, dig, you dig the portion and you can put this conical flask inside that sand. And all these things will be heated up. So that is why we can, we try to use sand bath when our requirement is higher temperature. But again, you have to see that what type of sand, depending on the temperature, which sand, what is the maximum temperature it can go. Hmm. And then you also, you have to see the containers, which container you are using that should be stable at that time. Like plastic container, plastic uh, material you cannot uh, use there, it will be melted. So you have to see all these things, maybe glass material or maybe some metallic things, but metal, uh, as soon as you are going to use metallic uh, material or metallic container, you have to see the reagent or the chemical you are going to put in that container that should not react with the metal of which the container is made of. So considering all these things, you have to select which equipment or which uh, particular type of material to be used. Okay. <clears throat> so there are some more things to be discussed and those things include you must be aware about acid base and neutralization. Just I was mentioning when we were trying to see titration, we were discussing that acids are there, bases are there and and uh, what do we know about, about acid? The pH of acid is less than 7 and that pH depends on what is the hydrogen ion concentration. So, in the previous class, we have seen that what is the hydrogen ion concentration that can be measured using pH meter. So, if you use pH meter and you find that pH of this particular solution is, say for example, 4.5, then you can say that this particular solution is acidic in nature. If you use pH meter and find that this solution, pH of this solution is 8.5, then you can say that this particular solution is basic in nature. Okay, And if you want to bring the pH of that particular solution which is having pH 8.5 to neutral. Neutral means what? 7 degree. Oh sorry. 7. pH should be 7. So to bring that pH to 7, you have to add, I am talking about the solution which is having pH 8.5 and I have to bring down to 7, neutral pH. So I will need to add the solution which is having lesser pH. So I will take solution of pH uh, 8.5 in this container and I will add a little bit of the solution which is having maybe pH 4.5. So 8.5 and 4.5 we are adding, mixing it. So pH will come down. It will proceed towards 7 and the pH 4.5, this will again go on increasing. So when the pH comes to 7 degree, neutral pH, then we can say that this basic solution which was here, 8.5 pH, which was added with acidic solution, having pH 4.5 and now if pH is 7, means neither this is acidic nor this is basic, but this is now neutral pH. So this reaction is called neutralization reaction. So acid is losing, means increasing its pH going towards 7 and base is decreasing its pH going towards 7. So bringing to neutral pH that is 7 is called neutralization because of the reaction, acid-base reaction and 
that is the neutralization dioxide. Okay. So the whole titration is based on this concept only. You have to go on adding from the burette one solution and in beaker another solution. Go on adding till the pH becomes to neutral or neutralization is achieved. Neutral solution is made. So and when you are achieving pH seven, then you will stop titration. Okay. So this is all about titration, neutralization, and you must also be knowing that strong acids and weak acids. If you study basic biochemistry, you will be able to find out what is the difference between a strong acid and weak acid. so a strong acid are those acid which are able to fully dissociate so it will be able to donate all the hydrogen so that type of acid is called a strong acid and weak acid they are partially donating hydrogen okay they will donate but slowly so Weak acid are not harmful. Of, uh, of course, I am talking about uh, living organisms or particularly human beings. For human beings, weak acids are not that much harmful com compared to the strong acid. Now, let us talk about what is the, what are the examples of a strong acid and weak acid. So, if we take example of a strong acid, HCl, sulfuric acid. So these are strong acid. If they are going to fall on your skin, the burning will be there. So they are that much strong, or they are that much dangerous. But weak acids are not that much dangerous. We even eat weak acids sometimes for some preparation. You might have heard of sirka. You might have heard of Acetic acid. We are using acetic acid, or we are adding acetic acid when we are making pickles, and we are eating pickles, pickles made with acetic acid. We are every morning, or during this COVID-19, we used to take nimbu pani, wo bhi thoda garam karke, so that it will boost. Of course. Uh, that is vitamin C, source of vitamin C. We are not taking weak as weak acid. We are taking as source of acid. But those things are acidic in nature because pH are around uh, 2.5, 3, something like that. So they are weak in nature. They are weak in causing harmful effects. Okay, so. You must be also knowing that buffers. And if you go on in laboratory, you may sometimes need to use buffers. Again, buffers are made of acids and conjugate base. But remember that they are not strong acids. They are made of weak acids. So definition of buffer itself says that the buffer should contain, of course, other points are also there. So simply one point I am telling you is buffer is made of weak acid and its conjugate base. It's, you cannot make buffer using a strong acid. Whenever we are going to make buffer, that should be made of weak acid and its conjugate base. So these are all biochemistry. We are not going into that. But just I wanted to say that buffers are always made of weak acid not using a strong acid like HCl and sulfuric acid. Okay. So sometime we need to calculate or we need to say that I need one normal HCl. Somebody may need 
too normal HCL. Somebody may need, no, no, I need only 0.5 normal HCL. So, you should know how to, or what does it mean? One normal, two normal, or 0.5 normal, and how to make that. So, similarly, this is about a C. So, you can also ask that NOH. One normal NOH, 0.5 normal NOH, or two normal NOH. So, this calculation should be known to you, how to calculate it. And you should also know that this one normal, two normal, 0.5 normal, what does it mean? It means strength. So the formula I said that was N1 V1 is equal to N2 V2. Other way also you can say S1 V1 is equal to S2 V2. N, N for normality. So that is what normal I am talking of. 1 normal, 2 normal, 3 normal, 0.5 normal. So N1, N for normality. What is the normality? And V for volume, how much? 100 ml, 50 ml, 200 ml. So N1, V1. N stands for normality, V stands for volume. Instead of saying N1, V1, somebody may say S1, V1. S means strength. What is the strength? 1 normal. What is the strength? 0.5 normal. What is the strength? 2 normal. So N or S, same thing, either N1 or S1. N replaced by S. N means normality, S means strength. So strength is being expressed in the terms of N only, normality only. So don't get confused and don't say that N1 V1 is something else and S1 V1 is something else. No, so they are the same thing, but expression wise, strength is expressed in normality. Or here you are saying directly normality, there you are indirectly saying normality in terms of strength. <coughs> so, strength of the solution, which is one normal, compared to the strength of solution, which is too normal, which is more strong or which one is having more strength. Too normal is having more strength compared to one normal. Similarly, 0.5 normal is half of the one normal. Or we can say one normal is half of the two normal. Or we can say two normal is double of the one normal. Normality. Now another term is there, normality and molarity. So what is the difference between normality and molarity? Now let us take example of two acids. Let us talk about acid to understand about normality and molarity. So one acid, HCl, Another acid is H2SO4. These two names must be heard by you. You must be very uh, much aware about these two acids. H2SO4, that is also known as sulfuric acid, and HCl, that is known as hydrochloric acid. Both of these two acids are strong acid, very, very harmful for your skin, or you can say very, very harmful for your harmful for you, whether it is going to drop on your uh, clothes, it will be burned, whether it is going to drop on your skin, it will be burned, acid burning will be there. Hmm? So you, while handling it, you have to be a apron, uh, sorry, aprons of course to protect your cloth, uh, clothing and then gloves so that you can, because you are going to uh, catch the bottle, you sift the bottle or uh, the bottle container containing hydrochloric chloric acid or sulfuric acid. So beer, better to wear gloves so that directly that acid is not coming directly in touch of, it is not touching your skin. So you are protected. 
it must be touching uh, uh, gloves but not your skin so hydrochloric acid formula if you write hcl sulfuric acid what is the formula h2 so4 hmm? so we are going to talk about normality and molarity so first we will talk about molarity so when we try to calculate molecular weight hcl what is the molecular weight of hcl you must be knowing atomic mass of hydrogen you must also be knowing atomic mass of chlorine h cl 1 h 1 cl if you add the atomic mass of these two then you will get atomic mass of atomic weight of h cl okay now coming to h2 so4 h2 2 h hmm? so molecular weight not molecular weight Uh, mass of hydrogen into two because two hydrogen is there plus H two is over S single S O four so mass of two hydrogen plus mass of sulfur plus mass of four oxygen if you pull all this together that will be the mass of or atomic weight of H2SO4. So this way you can calculate molecular weight of H2SO4 and you can calculate molecular weight of hydrochloric acid. So now you know what is the molecular weight of hydrochloric acid, what is the molecular weight of H2SO4. Okay. So this was calculation of molecular weight. once you have calculated molecular weight now we will try to make solution and one molar solution again if we talk about molarity there is similar term molality molarity and molality but many of the time most of the times we are talking about molarity molality rarely we are talking so i am not going to confuse you just i have introduced that m may mostly it stands for molarity but it may also stand for molality which you need not bother about knowing it and not don't go into deeper uh, behind molality so let's concentrate only on molarity if you are biochemistry student and all these things then molarity molality all those things will be taught to you but being a general student we will simply say that molarity m means molarity okay so if you have calculated molecular weight say for example 50 molecular weight of particular compound is 50 50 so take 50 g put a gram in front of that 50 g 50 g to take 50 g of that particular compound and dissolve into water and make up the volume to 1 liter one molecular weight in gram say for example it was 50 so 50 g dissolved in 1 liter the total volume should be 1 liter then that particular solution will be called one molar okay now consider another example molecular weight again 50 but this time i am going to take 100 g 50 g plus 50 g twice and dissolve in water so that 1 liter of this solution contains 100 g of that particular compound means how many mole two moles 50 plus 50 double two moles so 
the strength of that particular solution will be two mole. If I am dissolving fifty gram, one mole. Hundred gram, two mole. Hundred fifty gram, three mole. And two hundred gram, four mole. Two hundred fifty gram, five. Mole. So one molecular weight in gram. If you weigh that much and dissolve in one liter solution, then it is called one molecular. Again, coming back, fifty gram was the molecular weight. Now I am taking only five gram, not fifty gram. If I take fifty gram, then it will be one molar. If I take only five gram, then what will be the molarity? Point one molar, ten times less gram I have taken, so ten times less molarity. Any doubt? Anything? I cannot get answer from you. So anyway, so this was all about molarity. Now. Coming to normality, so to make this clear, what is the difference between molarity and molarity? Uh, normality, I will have to introduce another thing that is HCl. Now we have to see HCl and H2SO4. H2SO4, how many H is there? Two. HCl, how many H is there? One. Okay, so you have to calculate molecular weight of both. Say for example, again I am telling you example, not exactly the figure. Okay, so don't consider this as molecular weight. I am taking for easy, easy understanding. I am taking the imaginary value. Say for example, H two SO four molecular weight is hundred. is 2s4 100 hcl is 50 okay this is just example molecular weight of example it is not that exactly the molecular weight is 2s4 if molecular weight is 100 hcl is molecular weight 50 okay two hydrogen in case of h2s4 only one hydrogen in case of hcl hmm? so if i take 100 gram of H2SO4 dissolved in one liter solution, then molarity of this solution will be one. Okay. If I take 50 gram of HCl and dissolve in one liter solution, then it will be one molar HCl. One molar HCl, one molar H2SO4. Depending on the molecular weight, because molecular weight is 100, so I am Considering that the solution, one liter solution should contain 100 gram. This molecular weight is 50. That is why I am considering 100 gram of HCl in one liter solution. Okay. Now, normality. So, normality of this H2SO4 will be two. Or normality of This HCl will be one. It means I am talk, uh, first talking about HCl. Normality and molarity of HCl is the same. Normality and molarity of HCl is same because to make one molar, to make one molar HCl, I have to take fifty gram of HCl in a solution, one liter solution. One, uh, it is having only one H, so molarity and normality is the same. Now coming to H2SO4. To make one molar solution, hundred gram I am taking. So whatever solution is made, that is one molar. But if I want one normal, because it is having two H2. Means H is two, so normality will be half, or we can say this is two normal. One molar H two S H two S O four is 
two normal HDLs. So if I want one normal, then I have to take only 50 gram of H2SO4 and then dissolve in one liter. Understood? So H2SO4, one molar H2SO4 is too normal. But HCl, one molar is equal to one normal. If you want to make two normal, then you have to increase that means it will be two molar solution. So that is the difference between normality and molarity. Okay. So let us just stop here and we will see in the next class what are the things we are going to cover. Okay. So we will stop here and we will meet in the next class. Okay. Bye-bye.